Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 23rd of January and a nice little selection of updates this week. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like, subscribe, comment and share and hit that bell icon to get notified of new updates. First, as always, I do have the chapters in the description so you can jump to a specific update that interests you the most if you wanna skip um, some of the others. New videos this week, I created a deep dive video all about managed identity. This super powerful feature for when I have some resource in Azure that needs to have permissions to something else that trusts Azure AD, well, I can do that without having to worry about storing certificates or secrets. So I, I dive into all of, about how to use it and how it works under the covers. And then I've talked a lot of times about Azure AD is not AD in the cloud, but I've never really talked about, well, what is AD? So I created an Active Directory deep dive video to really explain the structure of Active Directory. Also, I released a little GitHub repo. So this repo is all of my sessions around the certifications. So like my AZ900 full course and its handout, then links to all of the particular study crams and I consolidated all of the whiteboards, I reformatted them all into this new single repo. So that's available now, again, in the link in the description below. I wanted to say a huge thank you. So I do have that charity t-shirt store where I put kind of the t-shirts that I make up just for a bit of fun. All the money goes to cure childhood cancer. Well, we hit $1,000. So a huge shout out to everyone who bought a t-shirt and supported the charity. So just thank you, that's awesome. So moving on, on the compute side. So a number of updates around the Azure Kubernetes service. Remember that managed Kubernetes service in Azure. The first is now in preview is a version alias. When I deploy an AKS cluster, I have to give it the full version. That includes the major version, dot minor version, dot patch. So you see those three numbers, for example, 1.21.7. What this version alias lets you do is you can skip the patch and it will automatically select the latest patch for the minor version you specify. So if I just said, hey, I wanna deploy 1.21, it would go and check what's the latest patch version. Oh, it's 1.21.7 and would install that. It is in preview, so I have to have the AKS preview extension installed for my AZ CLI but then I can skip specifying that patch version. Upgrade events went GA. During an update of my Kubernetes cluster, there are various events logged and made available. I can do kubectl git events, for example. Now these events refer to things like draining pods from a node, updating the status of a node, success or failure, creating and deleting surge nodes. Remember surge nodes are automatically added when there is an AKS maintenance event happening so that before we start draining a node and therefore reducing the capacity of the cluster, we add in these additional nodes so our capacity can stay the same. So we don't lose capacity during those operations. So there are events when we create those surge nodes and we delete those surge nodes. By default we get one, but I can specify a specific number or a certain percentage of the total number of nodes. So now I can easily go and get those events for me. Windows container hosts now have container D support. So container D is the standard container runtime today for Linux. It's the only option, it replaced Docker. Now for my Windows container hosts, if it's 1.20 version of Kubernetes or above, we can now select to use container D. This will become the only version once Kubernetes hits 1.23. If you think back, this doesn't really change anything about how you need to act or modify your code. In ye old days, Docker was used as the container runtime. Now Docker itself used the Mobi project, which sat on top of container D, but you had to have this special shim in place for Kubernetes to talk to the Mobi project through the container runtime interface. Well, with container D and removing that Mobi project and removing the Docker part, there's now just a plugin for container D for that very efficient Kubernetes communication. So it's a better option. 
So now I can enable it for my Windows container host, it will become the default and only option from 1.23. There's now support for FIPS node pools. So FIPS is this federal information processing standard. You'll hear about this 140-2 for US government standards around encryption and cryptographic modules. Now for Linux nodes only, when I create a new node pool, I can specify I want it to be FIPS 140-2 enabled. I cannot set it on an existing node pool. It's only when I create the node pool. I can also specify it as the default node pool at time of an AKS cluster creation. But again, I can't set it after the fact. And ultra disks are now supported on AKS. If you think of managed disks, there are really those four types, standard HDD, standard SSD, premium SSD, and ultra disk. Ultra disk gives me the lowest latency, the highest performance, and I can individually tweak the capacity, the IOPS, and the throughput. And those IOPS and throughput, I can even change dynamically. It can be being used and I can change those values as potentially my needs changed during the time. So now I can use those in AKS as well. Azure API Management now has managed certificate support. So instead of having to buy my own certificate and worry about the life cycle, I can now for my custom domain names, I can say, hey, API management, you create the certificate for me and you manage the life cycle. So I don't have to worry about it. It will just make it so and keep it current. On the database side, so Postgres hyperscale, so this is Postgres using the Citus extension to give me that distribution of the data over multiple worker nodes. Now it's available in new regions. So East Asia and Central India now has Postgres Hyperscale. And there are a whole bunch of new certifications made available for it. If we actually go and look for this, what we can see is this giant list of all of these certifications that now are available for Postgres Hyperscale. So if those relate to any of the industries you're in, if you require those, then this should make things a whole lot easier. Coming on, also now for PostgreSQL Flexible. So remember Flexible is the version of the managed database that's VM based. That gives me a lot of additional capabilities. I think about HA, high availability options, so I can have a version ready to just automatically take over. There's availability zone supports. I can use burstable size virtual machines. I can stop and start. And I have control over those various maintenance windows. Well, these are also now available in new regions, specifically China East 2 and China North. Azure SQL Managed Instance has backup redundancy options now available in GA. By default, it's GRS RA. But I can also specify, hey, I just want LRS or ZRS. Remember, ZRS is three copies spread over availability zones in the same region. And Azure Cache for Redis now has managed identity support. This could be system assigned, where the lifecycle of the identity is linked to the resource, or it can be user assigned, where I create the identity and then give permission for various resources to use it. That's super useful if multiple resources need the same set of permissions to target resources. So that's in preview. That's really gonna be super useful where my Redish needs to go and talk to storage accounts. So now I can use the system assigned identity and give that system assigned or user assigned identity permission on the storage account. So I don't have to worry about any credentials. Miscellaneous. There were some updates around Azure Monitor. So Azure Monitor Alerting has a new API version. It's 2021-8-1. It gives me features like resource-centric alerting, large-scale alert rule support, uh, over 6,000 alert rules. But one of the nice things it's done is this new alert rule experience. If we actually jump over for a second, so if we go and look at the portal, let me just close this down. It's now brought Azure Monitor creating a new alert rule into the same experience as the rest of the Azure portal, i.e. these small steps that are wizard driven. So here we can see, hey, let's select the scope. 
So I might say, okay, I want a certain type of resource. We might say virtual machines, for example. And then once we see our virtual machines, I could specify the particular virtual machine I want. We can then see all the different types of available signals. We've got metrics, logs, and the activity log. Once I've selected that, now I go to a different step. Now I can specify the conditions. Well, hey, I'm gonna look at a metric signal, and maybe I care about, hey, my CPU credit's remaining because it's burstable. And that's where I can then say, okay, I'm gonna set a specific fixed number, or maybe I wanna use that machine learning and let it look at what's happened in the past so I can set those values. And then I can go and specify actions if I want to, et cetera, et cetera but it's this nice wizard-driven experience now rather than that single great big page and I kind of wandered through trying to work out what I should or shouldn't configure. One minute frequency log alerts at GA. One of those signal types I can have for alerts is a log analytics workspace. And the way that works is I create a Custo query that it's gonna run at an interval I specify. Now I can make that interval as low as one minute. So every minute it would run that query looking for the results. And then based on those results, it could now trigger an alert to fire. Now the more frequently you run the query, the more money you will pay. So you do need to consider that. But if I had something now super time critical, I can all go all the way down to a one minute frequency to do that query, to run the check of the results and potentially fire off an alert. And then additionally, multiple export rules to the same event hub namespace as possible. So when I create diagnostic settings, I specify the targets in groups of settings. This could be a log analytics workspace, could be a storage account, it could be an event hub. And I can have multiple sets of those. So what this is now saying is, I can have multiple sets of these configurations going to the same event hub namespace. Now the event hub namespace is really just a management container. It has the network endpoint, it has different network protection settings, certain features. And then within that namespace, you have the event hubs themselves, like a topic in Kafka terminology. And what I can now do is as part of the rule, I can now use this optional parameter, which is the event hub name, as part of the configuration. So now I can actually have different event hub um, rules go into the same namespace because I can specify that optional parameter to have a different event hub name within the namespace. So that is now available to you. And those are the updates for Monitor and all of them. So as always, uh, appreciate you watching. I hope this was useful. Until next video, take care.